And it's in the breaking We come on bound And it's in the giving We Welcome to A Medicinal Mind, Wisdom and Well-Being, a podcast dedicated to the telling of authentic stories and the sharing of insightful wisdom, exploring science and spirituality, medicine and mother nature. No topic is off limits when it comes to growing our personal understanding and supporting our collective well-being. With your host, Dr. Rob Abbott, a family medicine resident practicing spiritually focused and evolutionarily informed functional medicine. We hope to nourish your being so that you can flourish in whatever the moment has called for you to do. In episode 24 of A Medicinal Mind, Wisdom and Well-Being, I interview McKay Rippey a New York licensed acupuncturist who specializes in the treatment of chronic Lyme disease. McKay first started his study of acupuncture in 1989, before I was born, at the Maryland Institute of Integrative Health, and has been in practice for more than 25 years. For the last several years, he has been a pioneer in the field of chronic Lyme disease, bringing free content to thousands suffering from chronic illness as part of his website and podcast. Lime Ninja Radio. As you will hear in the show, I was quite fortunate to stumble across McKay and his work, and I'm so grateful to have connected with his passion for helping those suffering with chronic Lyme. McKay starts us off with his unique background and persistence to finally discover his calling in acupuncture. He then leads us into his own experience with Lyme and how it inspired him to broaden his view seeking to help others through his podcast and blog. We then get really practical and down to earth as McKay and I dig into the disease process behind Lyme, the current evolving state of diagnosis, and the interplay between the body's immune system and the presence of various viral and bacterial pathogens. McKay offers his advice for patients who are suffering and worried they may be afflicted with chronic Lyme. McKay provides us with some recent insights as part of his foray into the newest cutting-edge research behind Lyme and Lyme treatment, asking such questions as, what are biofilms? Are antibiotics able to penetrate these bacterial colonies? What are the alternatives to antibiotics? Are they efficacious and reasonable to treat Lyme? How important are stress management and dietary modifications to heal from Lyme? How about neuropsychiatric manifestations of Lyme disease? Are they real? McKay's wealth of knowledge and curiosity is a blessing to thousands seeking wellness. I hope you enjoy this conversation and be sure to check out McKay's page and podcast to dig deeper into Lyme disease. Without further ado, let's start the show. Well, McKay, thank you so much for joining me today for a little conversation about perhaps Lyme disease. I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to talking with you. I mean, it was so funny. I got your email almost minutes after I just got rejected by a doctor on the other side. So you're you're starting your residency. This doctor, I don't know if he's retired yet or he's close to retirement. He looks like his photo looks like he's in his 70s, right? And uh, I said, you know, would you like to come on to Lyme Ninja Radio to talk about Lyme disease and help people educate about your approach to it? Because he has some YouTube videos up and they, you know, he's got something to say. So I wanted to hear and get that voice out there. And he writes an email back, says, you no, it seems like you advocate alternative medicine. I say, well, I'm an acupuncturist and we talk about stuff and I have entered quite a few physicians on the show and we've talked about antibiotics before uh, and I you know, really would like to hear what you have to say. It won't be a hostile interview. I'm not going to go after you. It's not my style. 
and then crickets. <laughs> that was it. I think he was polite, politely telling me there's no way in heaven that I'm going to be on your show. And uh, so, not that, so literally seconds after, you know, I sent that email off and the no response from this doctor, and we communicated like four or five times during the day, I got your email. I was like, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Mr. Rippy, but I'm <laughs> Rob Abbott and I'm a resident. And I thought what you have to say is interesting. So anyway, it's perfect timing. I'm just thrilled to get in this conversation. Yeah, wow. You know, it's it's fate, you know, divine intervention, whatever you want, a synchronicity. Uh, I'm just, um, that's hilarious to, to hear that story. So, um, you know, part of me was like, I wish I had found your work earlier. But then I also try to come back and be, well, hey, I know who you are right now. So let's let's start from, let's start from here. So, um so yeah, so thank you for, for joining me and perhaps, you know, to get things started, maybe let people know a little bit about your background and, and what it is you, you're currently doing. Well, how far back in background do you want? It's like professional background, personal background, all of the above. Ooh, man. So, you know, I do kind of like some of the, the childhood experiences because I think they can be quite formative, but you are totally free to start wherever you would like. I was born in D.C., in the city. So a lot of people say I was born in Washington, D.C., and they mean they were born in Alexandria or you know, outside and in, in, on the Maryland side of things. But I was actually born in D.C. And my... Fr- the enclave of, of Nova. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, in what is Adams Morgan area on, on Calvert Street. And my front yard was about the size. It was like six feet by six feet. And our job, one of our weekend chores was to cut the grass out front with hand clippers. It was that small. And now I live on 30 acres on up, in upstate New York. And somewhere in between there, I found acupuncture or acupuncture found me. And it was, my, my dad was a patient of acupuncture. He had some materials laying around the house. So I'd come home from school, from college, and would read about this. And I was not interested in Chinese food. I didn't like Chinese history. I wasn't you know, interested in yoga. I wasn't interested in anything to do with Eastern culture. And somehow what these acupuncturists were talking about resonated deeply. And I think what it was is one of my earlier teachers, talking about earlier uh, influences, one of my earlier early teachers. I went to Montessori school. He was a park ranger. And we ha- we went to the school uh, on an estate, an old estate in D.C., where there's these lovely grounds. So here I am, this city boy who lives in this little tiny row house, and I'd hop on the L2 bus, and it'd take me you know, about 25 minutes to get to this uh, estate school up by the zoo, and I'd walk a couple blocks up there. That's back when kids could walk to school unattended, right? <laughs> so I'd walk, I'd walk oh, yeah. up, you know, the final <laughs> bit of this up through this long driveway, and it was just magical. So I went from this little tiny row house to this magical, big, old wooded estate, and so nature just amazed. It was always this magical kind of thing, almost like this Disney thing, right? You're going from one state to to another. And what they were speaking about with these acupuncture magazine articles was how if you pay attention to nature and follow nature's laws, that's all you need to do to be healthy. And it just absolutely fascinated me. And I was interested in the big picture stuff, like the the articles that was like, hey, you need use this point and this point to take care of menopausal symptoms didn't interest me that much. You know, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm a 21-year-old, 20-year-old young man. It's like, what do I want to know about menopause? So I'm sitting in the sunshine one winter afternoon reading this magazine, and the little voice says, you could study this. And the little voice answers back, I'm going to study this. And uh, that that was as much thinking as I went into that decision to study acupuncture. And off I went. And they rejected me the first year. They said, you're too young. You're going to be dealing with women who are in menopause. <laughs> you know? So I was like, okay, I can, I, I can understand that because it wasn't particularly my interest anyway. And then the second year I applied, this is, this is like a typical Chinese uh, 
apprentice story. So I come back the next year and they say, ah, you're back again. I said, yes, I'm back again. Well, you're still pretty young. However, if you stay an extra year in our clinic so we can keep an eye on you, we think uh, you might be an okay acupuncturist. I said, fine, whatever I have to do, I'm in, right? Okay, okay. Money didn't come through. My financial picture wasn't quite up to snuff at that point. Uh, third year rolls around, right? And at this time, it's like, oh, it's you again. I said, wait, wait, wait. You know, I've, I've gotten married. I'm much more mature. So I had gotten married. And they say, okay, you can, you can matriculate now. And by that point, I had got my financial act together. And I started acupuncture school. And that was in 1989. And that was still the period of time where you could go and have a conversation with somebody at a party and say, you know, what are you studying? I'm studying acupuncture. And people would still say, what's that? So that's that's how long ago that was. Yeah. You don't you don't well, run into that anymore. Matter of fact, here since you said you like stories, so I'm standing at Mondalman Mall MVA in Baltimore to get my uh, driver's license renewed, and it is nobody wants to be there. The employees don't want to be there. Nobody in line wants to be there. And it's <laughs> right. And it's the not. kind of place where <laughs> you go and stand in line to find out what line you need to stand in line to go to, right? And it's 20 minutes in each line. So it's it's you, you have foxhole, you have MVA line friends, right? So this old Jewish man behind me strikes up a conversation. So, young man, I turn around. Hello, how you doing? Tell me a little about yourself. Well, I'm going to school. Oh, school, that's wonderful, wonderful. What are you studying? Acupuncture. He goes, oh, acupuncture, acupuncture. What, how long does it take to become an acupuncturist? I said, I'm getting a master's degree. It's a three-year program. Three years, three years. What the hell do you want to be an acupuncturist for? <laughs> I said, three years, you could be a doctor. <laughs> You're wasting your time. Right. So I calmly looked at him and said, I don't like blood. <laughs> Which was a bit, of, a bit of a fib, but <laughs> I needed to win the argument. I was, you know, t- 22. Fits, yeah, exactly. Fits the story a little bit. <laughs> I don't like blood. And then he looks at me, kind of cocks his head a little bit and says, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so that's the, those were the days. Wow. No, thank you so much. And yeah, kind of what you said in there, I, I really do resonate with you know, storytelling and just being able to hear the passion behind people's work and, and where they are now, because it really does speak so much about why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I don't, I don't say that to, to try to pass any judgment on anyone else within their professions or expertise, but I think um, the more often I, I dig into and, and listen to the stories of my patients and, and connect to some of my colleagues, there are some just truly amazing stories of how people get into, I guess in this context, medicine and, um, and healthcare and, and just wanting to, to help people. And oftentimes we get stuck just seeing the, the end result, the final outcome. We don't think about the process that went into becoming you know, XYZ clinician. And it's really easy to uh, disregard that and, and recognize, you know, why someone is doing what they're doing. They're not just a doctor. They're not just an acupuncturist. Um, we're all, well, yes, we're all, you know, incredibly unique and we have these, you know, unique stories. At the same time, paradoxically, we're also, you know, kind of all the same, this collective unified self. And so um, it's something I've come to, you know, further appreciate. And it takes work to stay, to stay grounded there. So um, all that being said, like I said, I'm just glad that, thank you for, for sharing that story. And you know, I guess, you know, counter to that, I, uh, as I kind of mentioned a little bit in the intro and, and, and talking so far, you know, came across your work uh, and your podcast, which you've been doing for quite a, quite a long time now and have accumulated quite uh, a repertoire of interviews and discussions about sort of the topic more broadly of kind of maybe chronic disease and, and more specifically of, of Lyme disease and, it's something, so I've grown up in Virginia my whole life, spent time in North Carolina, and while it's not Lyme, Connecticut, uh, it's quite a big problem here, and it's certainly something, if you go around traditional circles talking about, quote, chronic Lyme disease, sometimes you get people looking at you with, you know, like you have four eyes and two noses, and I think, you know, 
amidst all the stories and things that are told, it's hard for me to look back at them and say, are you completely discrediting, discrediting the experiences? And actually quite a decent body of literature supporting uh, the nature of these infections, just because maybe you don't have a full understanding of it doesn't mean you need to talk badly about it. And I've tried to remain curious and open to discover things outside of what I've been formally taught and am willing to, to remain open to to different treatments, different ways of diagnosing, and, and ways to just simply be with someone during a period of suffering. And so I wanted to really have you on to, to talk a little bit about you know, different aspects of this. We can maybe first start with, um, well, I'll kind of let, let you decide where, where you want to begin, but would really love to get your idea of, you know, what is Lyme disease itself? And maybe step beyond the the tick and the bacteria, but you know, have us you know, give us a little introduction into what in the world is Lyme disease. First problem with Lyme disease is that it is technically a single infection caused by a single bacteria, and actually a, a single strain of bacteria, a Borrelia but a specific Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi, right? So that technically is Lyme disease. And that is one of the problems at the heart of this, the strain between the people who are suffering, right? And either being told they don't have Lyme or we gave you your three weeks antibiotics, you can't have Lyme anymore or chronic. Lyme is really shorthand. Once you, (laughs) I describe, once you start studying Lyme disease, you've gone through Alice in Wonderland's looking glasses. Like the whole world changes, right? (laughs) The the world of these subclinical infections comes on. And Lyme disease is just the poster child. It's just the poster child. So unfortunately, there's no catchy phrase that we can repeat, you know, Lyme and other tick-borne infections. It just doesn't roll off the tongue like Lyme disease does. So in the community that now I've become part of, we say Lyme disease, but in the back of our mind, we know we mean all the other tick-borne infections. We might even be talking... Yeah, you understand yes. it means co-infection. co-infection and yeah. maybe even mold infection and maybe even metal toxicity that's, you know, now a problem because of the the impaired detoxification pathways that naturally we're taking care of things. So yeah. we, we, we know it means so much more than that. But the other issue with Lyme is, or these type of infections, is they interrupt fundamental processes in the body. And they do it in a slow, these, these infections are patient, not like a patient but they ha- they have all the time in the world. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit earlier when we were getting ready for the interview that the you know the two weeks antibiotic doesn't even cover the life cycle of the the antibiotics. I asked Eva Shapi recently. No, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Holly Ahern. She's up at SUNY Andorotic and uh, studies Lyme and other bacteria. And I asked her flat out. So what's what's the life cycle of Lyme? You know, a Lyme bacteria, a Lyme cell, and. Uh, well, it's not a cell, but anyway, you know what I mean. It, and she was unwilling to go on record. And this is something she's studying. So it's normal antibiotic exposure, normal like a, a, a stomach flu. You're talking about the bacteria reproducing in, in hours, right? In very short cycles, yeah. minutes even. And they don't, this bacteria just takes its time. You know, it's like it's sipping a beer on a porch, and it's just you know waiting for its window of opportunity, and so when it gets rolling, uh, it's it's very slow, and you can't treat it with just a couple weeks, right? You, it's we know tuberculosis. There's no way you treat tuberculosis with a couple weeks antibiotics. Say you're good, you know. If you're still sick after TB, yeah. you know it's not the TB. You've got post TB chronic something or other, you know. No, that's a good point. I don't want to interrupt you there, but I mean, you talk to anyone in traditional medicine, and the first thing they'll tell you is, you try to grow TB, it's going to take you a long time to to grow that in culture to get a if there is you no know, TB present a positive result. And you know, classically treatments are six and nine months, so they, you know they'll look at you and be like, "Yeah, it completely makes sense for me when you talk about it with TB," but then you change the bug, and then they look at you yes. like you're crazy. And you know, th- there's all kinds. Unfortunately, the Lyme community, because of these misunderstandings. 
they really get down on doctors. They really get into conspiracy kind of things. And uh, I, I hope I don't lose yeah. my entire audience if they listen to this to say, I, I don't buy that stuff. <laughs> You know, it's no, you know, I, I doctors either. are I, yeah, right doctors are doing the best they can. It's just human nature and and egos and people's careers. And they said, no, I'm an expert, and I know what this is going on, and I know what it is. And the you know, you go back to simple things like hand washing and that whole story and Semmelweis and you know being hounded out of the medical profession and dying in an insane asylum because nobody believed them. It turns out he was right, but that that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. So Lyme, So back to your question. So what is Lyme disease? Well, so Lyme disease is an infection, right? And the initial infection usually causes something like a flu. So people have a flu-like reaction to it. And they may or may not have a rash. I mean, that's one of the other misnomers, that you will always get a rash. Only 40% of people remember getting a rash you know, who tested down the line with were positive for Lyme disease. And then you go back and out of those 40%, it's only something like 10% who get the classic erythema migrans. And that's just a fancy way of saying a bull, bullseye rash. Right. So yeah. if you happen to have a bullseye rash, like when I got Lyme, I had a bullseye rash, you're just lucky. You're just really lucky. Because at that point, any clinician can look at it and say, you know what, it doesn't matter what the test says, you've got a bullseye rash, we're going to get you started on antibiotics immediately. And that's the other thing that seems so important with these infections. So you can have this summertime flu and maybe a rash, maybe not a rash, maybe the rash is just in some area where you didn't see it. You're not going to feel a bite from the tick. You just, you don't. It's just the way their uh, attack works on you. Their saliva has anesthesia in it. You're just never going to feel it, right? If you're lucky, you'll see it. So the tick's going to stay on. You know, there's debate on how long it takes to transmit. The official dogma is 48 hours, but there are plenty of case histories of it being much shorter than that. And you, know, you, you get your, so you get infected a few days later, you get the flu. If you don't put it together with, oh, I could have been bitten by a tick or even maybe some other blood trading insect, right? Maybe a spider bite, maybe a mosquito bite. Up here, it's black flies, you know, something like that. So mm, there's other yeah. vectors besides just the, the tick, the deer tick. And then you have a flu. We all know what you do when you have a flu. You go to bed, you drink some fluids, maybe you take some over-the-counter stuff, and you wait to feel better. And you know what? With people with Lyme disease, they do feel better after a couple of days. It's not like some of these really hard-hitting Zika virus, stuff like that, where you're just down and out, and if you don't turn it around, you're going to die. It doesn't work that way. The immune system comes on, the Lyme bacteria starts mutating its shapes, burrowing into tissue, disseminating throughout the body. And then that's when it starts sipping its beer on the porch and hanging out. And hear these stories where people, yeah, I think they'll, because I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people with disease and have gotten really, really sick with it. Then they all say the, the stories, the Lyme story is all the similar thing. You know, I got bit, I was a little bit sick. I was okay for months, years, maybe sometimes even multiple years. And then some event happens, either they're reinfected or something stressful happens, and that's when their, stre uh, their health goes downhill. So this bacteria is just kind of hanging out, just hanging out. And then your immune system stress from something else, whether it's emotional stress or sometimes it's an inoculation. Uh, I've heard the story of a woman going over to India, you know, trip of a lifetime. She gets her inoculation, she goes over to India, and she is literally deathly sick over there and has to cut her trip back and come back home. And finally, after going, it's, and it's tough to clinically put all this together. So you start testing for autoimmune stuff, for rheumatoid arthritis, for lupus. You know, mm, then you go, yeah. well, maybe it's fibromyalgia. Well, you know, we'll test for infections. Well, you don't really, you know, your white blood cell counts up, but, you know, we, there's nothing really there. Uh, you know, there's no real history of something, so... Infection-wise, well, that doesn't seem very likely. And Lyme, even if they're testing for Lyme, there's so many reasons why the antibodies may be low and it doesn't show up on the ELISA test to begin with, or it doesn't meet the clinical definition of Lyme, or it's actually the CDC's definition of Lyme, which is you know so many bands, right? You have the five... Five out of eight yeah. bands, or something like that. I forget the exact number, Correct. but the, so so 
you know, you get people who said, yeah, well, I got I got a negative test and they have four out of the five bands. Right. So they'll they'll go along looking for an alternative diagnosis. And all the time, you know, sometimes they get prescribed steroids, right, because they're in so much pain or, you know, they have rash or swelling somewhere and their immune system is depressed because of the steroids and they get sicker. And again, doctors are scratching their head. Well, we can't find anything and we haven't really been able to put our fingers on it. Therefore, it must be must be psychological. Right. So then they get the referral to the psychologist. Yeah. So th this story happens over and over and over again. And then finally, what happens is either they go to an alternative practitioner who's willing to make mm -hmm. a clinical diagnosis, you know, aside from the test, or they get a test or a physician who makes a more liberal diagnosis based on the test results and maybe adds in some clinical findings as well. So I mean, they make a clinical diagnosis. And then all of a sudden, they start getting treated for an infection. And usually at that point, there's some turnaround in their condition, right? They start getting better. There's a glimmer of hope. Okay, this makes sense. And you, but usually the path out of it is, is brutal. It's like climbing out of quicksand. It takes perseverance. It takes struggle. But that, again, that's because the disease, the bacteria, has had so much time to disseminate and really take over the landscape within the body. And as you mentioned before, rarely does the Lyme come by itself. You know, there's the Babesia coming along or Bartonella or Ehrlichia and, and things like uh, Toxoplasmosis. And if there's any reservoir of viral infections, and come on, we're all one giant teeming pot of... <laughs> <laughs> of a <of> viral load, <laughs> right? Yes. You know, it, it gets reestablished. So if somebody had mono, chances are the monos now come back front and center too. And uh, those viral infections are just having a heyday too because Lyme is also immunosuppressant. It's very much like HIV that way. It allows other opportunistic infections or previous infections to get reestablished. And you know, you, and you know, I could just go on forever and ever. And and things like root canals or even uh, hip or joint replacements can be reservoirs of bacteria. When you're healthy, they're held in check. But when you get sick, you know, when your immune system's suppressed, all of a sudden those things become a, a serious impediment to getting well. Yeah. You know, I just, I'm listening to all of this and... Right. Just as a conceptual framework, so much of it makes you know so much sense, and you know, I keep drawing back some of these analogies to other applications in medicine. And I think you know most people wouldn't argue with you if you describe the process of the herpes virus. You know, a big class or a big family of viruses, the herpes viruses, um, and the connection to latency, remaining latent and sort of dormant in the dorsal root ganglion of the nervous system and our different you know, places and then being reactivated during periods of stress. And when we say stress, it's just like you described. It could be perceived emotional stress. It could also be the inoculation of a new virus or new bacteria or some other alteration of the immune system. And everyone would completely agree with you that, yeah, there's a reactivation of it and, and that you can make these connections. But then for whatever reason, we can't take that conceptual framework and then apply it to other situations, just like you've described for the Lyme bacteria, um, for Borrelia or these other organisms and see that it's all, it's a very similar, similar mechanism. When we boil it down, it's, you know, it's our immune system. It's, you know, dysregulation of the immune system. And it would make sense that a virus or a bacteria and trying to you know hijack the the machinery in the case of viruses to help them you know, to allow them to cells to replicate or bacteria in a way to survive is they need to evade the immune system so it makes complete sense that they're going to do everything that they can they've you know evolved to down regulate certain aspects of our immune system and we're starting to see you know research into vitamin D, or some people even calling it hormone D, and these disrupt, disruptions in uh, vitamin D metabolism in relation to certain chronic infections, mechanistically seeing that some of these viruses uh, are 
essentially blocking the action of the vitamin D receptor, where sort of the 25 hydroxy vitamin uh, D is you know meant to to bind and act, and they're basically blocking that as a way to you know minimize a immune response. And then concurrently, you can sometimes see a you know an upregulation then of you know this 25 being converted to 125. So you see this disproportionate sort of ratio. But just like once again at a mechanistic level, you start to see like put the pieces together. It makes complete complete sense why there will be, can be these long periods of latent dormancy that you don't manifest symptoms because symptoms generally are it's your own immune system's response. It's not the like presence of the organism or the pathogen itself. And so you shouldn't, you know, from the from the bacteria, the viruses might don't really want you to have symptoms after maybe that initial inoculation because then the immune system's onto you, right? It's the same idea with with cancer. Um, you know, cancer at one level is sort of a failure of the immune system to regulate cellular growth. And when we start to notice symptoms is when the tumor gets discovered, when the cellular population that's, um, you know, become dysregulated is actually noticed. And, you know, but before that, there was this, you know, area of cells, this, you know, this tumor that was sort of undetected to the body and was allowed to replicate you know, without any kind of prohi- prohibition. So, you know, like I said, these these frameworks are things that I've been seeking to try to understand more and, and remain curious about and kind of disseminate them at this conceptual framework level. And yes, like um, people can respond back and say, well, I want the definitive evidence for this organism and, and, and this life cycle and, and these properties. But, um, and, and I agree, like that would be great, but we need to, you know, make sure we don't lose the forest and looking for each individual tree. Um, and so I think what you've gone through and walked us through in the beginning is a great way to to see the greater picture of how this process can start. And I, I kind of see it as like almost a phenotype. It's not that anyone's individual story is um, is not unique or there you know, can be vast differences in someone's experience of the illness, but seeing this kind of general pattern. And that's how these communities start, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. when people's like, yes. holy crap, that's what happened to you? That's what like, happened. That's like yeah, my autobiography. Exactly. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's me too. Well, and just in terms of uh, mechanism, there's a little controversy now because Zhang down at Hopkins has found some iron inside the Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. Mm, yeah, but f- up to that point, they're pretty much the science was pretty much uh, showing that there wasn't much. So. Th- for the superoxide dismutase within the Borrelia, it was using uh, molybdenum or manganese. Oh, good grief. I think it's man- mm. manganese. Sorry, it's manganese. So forgive me for misspeaking there. And so it doesn't eat iron. So one of the body's main defenses against invasion is to sequester iron, right? And the, the yeah, and iron, the Borrelia yeah. just goes, you go right ahead. <laughs> No, you know, that, that's <laughs> right. Way. <laughs> I'm not drinking wine. I'm drinking beer. You can keep all the wine, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and the other thing that happens is the Borrelia has the ability to change form more so than other bacteria. So not only can it lose its protein outer coating, which makes it immune to the immune system because there's nothing for it to attach to, it can go into a cyst form or persister stage. And these cysts, there's Alan McDonald. He's a retired pathologist, went to the Harvard Brain Bank, bank, got 10 samples of Alzheimer's brain and was able to regrow Borrelia out of eight of the 10. So he was able to culture it. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's something that has been you know frozen right dissected put on the shelf for how knows who knows how long you know out of it out of a cadaver and still was able to persist so there's there's these persister cells and back to dr ahern at suny adirondack she estimates about seven percent of the borrelia go into cyst form anytime it's attacked as a community. So it communicates with each other. You're mm-hmm. sending an antibiotic, you're sending an herbal, you're sending a high fever at anything, it's going to go in. So you need these multiple rounds. So you need to then coax the Borrelia to come back out of cyst form to, to finish off the infection because otherwise it's just hanging out there. Now, maybe the load can be so low, right, that your immune system can keep any outbreak from g- going back and forth. And I, I think that's kind of where I am yeah. with my Lyme 
you know, if it's not completely gone. And mm-hmm. we, we will have tests within the next three to five years. You know, doctors, you you will have in your office a handheld test where you can just prick somebody's finger and we'll get a definitive answer on whether there's Lyme in there. But we're, we're still... Wow. If that is true, yeah. I would be so happy about it. And I mean, perhaps... Uh, I don't want to you know derail you from a, a thought, but maybe perhaps that's it could be a, a segue to to talk about testing, which is so controversial um, and something I've been trying to look more into with um, with my colleague who has dedicated so much of her um, work into uncovering and treating people with with Lyme. And so you know, but if you if you have some other thoughts first, please please go there. But we'd love to perhaps get into well, some of the the testing and um, yeah, your let thoughts. Me, let's get into let's get go right there. So one, of the, I was at a conference last year, and it's one of these big medicine conference or big data conference with, and it has to do with the uh, Lyme disease and big data, and put on by Mount Sinai in New York City. And there's some researchers, they're starting to, so researchers follow their research, you know, the area they're interested in, so they follow their passion, but they also follow grants. <laughs> so one of the things, some of well, exactly, so one of the things so. these researchers are starting to see is there, there's a little bit of money being granted for Lyme study. And so they're beginning to move over. And it was the end of the conference, and th- there's some people, researchers from the HIV side of things, community, research community, who are now starting to study Lyme. And this one researcher, young man, a PhD, you know, they're all brilliant, right? They're PhD MDs, and he's out of Stanford or UCLA out on the West Coast somewhere, and he stands up. And only like a scientist, you know, th- th- stands up and gives an insult. He says, you know, I was a little surprised when I came over to the Lyme community that you're still using the ELISA test. (laughs) He said, that technology is 40 years old and we haven't used that in the HIV community for about 20 years. Mm. You know, and I'm paraphrasing. So I may have got some of the years off, but essentially that's what he was saying. And he's... And that's that's the truth. The technology that we're using for these tests aren't very good. And I, it's so interesting. You talk to people in the Lyme community, and they talk about false negatives. You talk about people kind of in the ISDA world, and they talk about false positives, right? And and yeah. you know it, it may may because it's you know the two level test you go from the ELISA to the Western blot and the Western blot says ah it's not Lyme disease but there's so many reasons why an antibody may not be present in in somebody's system or let's put it this way is undetectable right that right. we. We we forget we forget those, and so there's estimates that we can be missing anywhere from on the low sides, you know, twenty, thirty, forty percent to the high sides, you know, seventy percent of infections. And we all know, my, when you know, I had the bullseye rash and I got tested and it came back negative. Of course, my body hadn't produced antibodies yet, right? And I'm not, Correct. you know, yes. I was asymptomatic at that point, so I'm not going to come back and get tested again. Right, but it came back negative, so I didn't get reported to anybody that I had Lyme disease. You know, the, the all the reporting uh, facilities with the public health people. Right, there's no Lyme disease in in Oneida County. The, so here's the other thing that's interesting: the the canine test is so much better on the vet world. If you want to find out if you have Lyme in your community, go talk to your vet, and your vet will tell you. The testing they have for vets, I mean, for dogs, is so good. And you will find that it's true. We had at a support group, this poor woman who runs a support group a couple miles from me, she uh, has had Lyme disease twice. And her second time trying to get treated mm. by her local primary, she goes in and says, you know, I'm pretty sure I have Lyme disease. Um, and he said, no, that's impossible. We don't have Lyme disease here in uh, Chittenango County, New York. And uh, later... On that week, you know, her dog's looking sick too, so she takes him to the vet and across, literally across the street in the small town. And the vet says, "Up, oh, your dog has Lyme disease, right?" And so she's pulling out her hair. It's like, how can I get a diagnosis? And I know we both got sick at the same time, you know, <laughs> oh these, these things like that. Yeah. And so here's here's a doctor not even willing to do the test. You know, I it seems to be shifting a little bit that the doctors are more willing to do a test, but the test 
is just it just it doesn't work. It's it's not. And it was never designed to be a diagnostic test. You go to CDC's website site. Here's the, here's the thing for doctors to know. You go to CDC's website, and it's for surveillance purposes. They say Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. You got to be up to speed, right? Correct. It's <clears throat> based on. So if you've got three out of five bands on the test, and somebody's sick, you know what? So here's the question I have for you. So we give antibiotics, we, meaning the universe, right? I mean, you doctors give antibiotics for, for, for <laughs> lots of different reasons. What's the harm? And I understand antibiotic resistance and all that too, but if that were the case, there'd be a drastic reduction in all antibiotic uses. Why is there resistance for somebody, the possibility of Lyme disease, they think might have Lyme, to give them two weeks, to give them a month of antibiotics? Yeah, you know, I, I sit here and I look at the double standard and in, in where, you know, antibiotics, we're doing a much better job, I will say, you know, in the primary care setting of being more judicious about when antibiotics are being prescribed. And people are tracking that data. And, and yes, it's going in, in the right direction. Um, but I still see, you know, day in and day out where, you know, antibiotics are given for upper respiratory infections, "Quote unquote sinus infections, um, you know, soft tissue, skin infections. When really it it's not entirely indicated, and it's given it's sa- that same sort of logical. Well, it it could be this, and just to be safe. But then the you know everything flips when it becomes potentially Lyme. And I think you know because individuals, patients don't usually come in." And say, oh, I think I have cellulitis, <laughs> um, or I think I like, you know, I think I have a soft tissue infection um, that I need antibiotics for. They just say, like, my, my leg's red and it's swollen. I don't really know what's going on, and it kind of itches. And but as you just described, people will oftentimes come in and say, you know, I have these symptoms, and I think I think I might have Lyme disease. And then perhaps unconsciously, subconsciously, in the doctor, they get a little, you know affronted by the patient diagnosing themselves and now suddenly it comes the patient's coming in requesting or telling them what they have and then inherently requesting treatment for it in this case antibiotics and then there's this decision of well i need definitive proof before i use this and then now that we've put on this secondary layer of let's be judicious with our antibiotic use this is an area where i guess doctors feel like oh i can make i can make a stand here by not prescribing antibiotics for unconfirmed Lyme disease when realistically they don't do the same in other areas. So it's just, it is speculation. It's perhaps me passing it a teeny bit of judgment, but I think it's a, it's an idea and something I've seen sort of play out. And I think that's where we have to step back and recognize, you know, as physicians that we're oftentimes not going to have a laboratory diagnosis to inform a clinical decision. And there are you know, a couple of physicians in my practice who I've talked to at length, and they have a very similar understanding as myself. They, you know, they completely get that the ELISA, the screening test, maybe at best is, you know, getting sixty to seventy percent of the people, and that's at best, um, and that leaves thirty to forty percent of people with a negative test that could, you know, that. Uh, could have Lyme. And as I think one of my preceptors said, like, that's a pretty crappy test. Right. Um, and, uh, and, especially and, when you compare it to like HIV. Ex- exactly. Like, and, um, and that's Horowitz quotes uh, an old New York State study where the test was only 70%, uh, I'm sorry, only 30%, uh, uh, what's the word? Effective. And there's another word I'm thinking of, but only caught sensitive. It's sensitive, like the yeah. sensitivity and, yeah. and specificity. Yeah. So in this case, we're, we're generally talking about sensitivity. Yeah. So it's missing 70% um, of, yeah. and, and this was this was a public health test where they did further tests later on. So they went back and actually confirmed. So this isn't even, you know, a guessing game. This this was exactly a public health study. But, but you know, so anyway, my point is, yeah, you're, you're talking about missing 30, 40 percent. Yeah. And, and it might be a lot more than that. So if, thir- if you're already saying that thir- missing 30 percent is a, not a very good test, to put it kindly, if you're missing more than that, it's a t- if you're missing it's a 70 terrible percent. test. <laughs> it's a terrible test. Um, now, yeah. 
Well, I think it's important too for people to realize, you know, when the doctor says you tested negative, so they go and have this test, which is the screening ELISA, you know, test. They go in and have this single test, and you know, doctor says it came back negative. You don't have Lyme. What isn't performed because it's a it's a reflex test in almost every situation is the sort of Western blot, um, you know, um, uh, immunoglobulin test, which you've been describing as these different bands. So it's basically different immune you know, antibodies reacting to aspects of the bacteria. And there's multiple different ones. And so that's why there's multiple different bands. And you look at that spread. That test isn't performed unless the initial screening Comes back test positive. is positive. Exactly. And so if we can't get that, the first test right, then we can't go and see the the right. this further sort of these these plots. And unless the doctor themselves and um, you, we we generally have to put up kind of a stink depending on which lab we're using. Unless we explicitly say, I just want the bands, I just want the Western blot and not the screening test, you won't get that information. And yeah, you might just get the screening test, and it might just come back negative. And unfortunately. That doesn't really say that much, as we've been discussing uh, so far today. Right, and that's what a lot of patients will end up do, do will end up doing is going to what's called a Lyme literate physician who's been either on their own or now there's a ILADS, uh, which is a physician based uh, organization that trains physicians, and they'll they'll just go right to the Western blot. But in order to do that, a lot of these physicians are bypassing insurance because just to stay clean and uh, away from their hooks and, and to bypass the rules uh, that they otherwise would have to go under. So this ends up being a $600 test just just to get started. And so the expense of it rolls rolls over very, very quickly. Now, one of the things, and I don't know, you're gonna, you, might, you may throw me off the show for this, but <laughs> so, so I... <laughs> no, one, no one gets thrown off the show. I, so if somebody in my community comes to me and you know, they're just saying, yeah, and I, I encourage them to go to their doctor. I really do. It's not, even though I'm an acupuncturist and you know, I try not to pop pills and most of my patients are that way, but it's like, there's... I love doctors. You know, they're, we, we need you guys, right? But sometimes doctors have to be led to the right diagnosis. So I, t- I, I coach them to essentially say, tell them you were bit by a tick. Well, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. You know, are you having symptoms now? Yeah. Do you live in a place where other people have been tick? Yeah. And you're not feeling so great, right? Um, it's like, tell them you, re- that, you know, you know, you saw the tick. You took it off. You didn't keep it. So you lead them. Yes, I was. I was exposed. That's yeah, the I was. Ex- you had exposed. I'm having symptoms now. And then, and then, even if your symptoms persist, you can go back and you know, or you can fudge and say, you know, they only got the two weeks antibiotics, and you know, it'd be better to have four weeks of the doxycycline to really help a little bit more of the life cycle of this slow growing Borrelia. So you know, four weeks is like kind of the underground minimum. That's what we say, when, if you can get four weeks right away, then probably you're going to be okay. So you go back and you say, you know, I'm still not feeling so great. Can I have another two weeks? Most doctors will say, yeah. But if you, you have to, you have to work the docs and give them the information that they need so that they can justify what they're doing. Because if you can't, well, you know this, if you can't justify what you're doing, you're going to get in trouble fast. You yes. know, and I've done the same yeah. thing for people with uh, similar things. Um, God, I'm trying to remember. You know, I don't remember if it's like blood sugar things or it's like oh thyroid things. Yeah, it's like you know you have to give enough information that the doctor's going to go down the differential diagnosis kind of in the direction you want it to go. And uh, you know, I don't mean this to go lying to people. You know, just making stuff. There are you know there are crazy people out there who just love to take drugs and love to see doctors, but most people don't. And, you know, unfortunately now, it's one of the phrases I'd, I'd like to educate the community with, well, first step one step back from that is, right now Lyme disease is diagnosed over the backyard fence. And sometimes it's the digital di- mm. backyard fence. Man, I heard a story recently and said, yeah, my Lyme disease was diagnosed on a Facebook group. 
You know, I was having all these symptoms and somebody recommended, you know, you should get yeah. tested for Lyme. So they went to the doctor and said, can I be tested for Lyme? And the doctor agreed, yes. And even with all the problems we talked about the test, this person came back positive. It's like, thank goodness. But, mm. you know, she was under care and had seen quite a few specialists, but nobody thought of, you know, any of these long-term infections. And again, it goes back to what you're saying. The, the disease itself you know the the uh, the Lyme arthritis is, and there, there seems to be a pretty uh, a common degradation in soft tissue, uh, connective tissue, uh, that happens with with chronic Lyme people too. So sometimes it seems like it it can be just disc degeneration or or something like that. But any, anyway, going back to the, the bacteria itself, the the symptoms it's caused are, are pretty simple and i think this is the problem but then the body's response to a chronic infection over time is like that that constant uh, inflammation process and whether that's you know inducible nos you know that's getting nitric oxide that's being thrown at the body just over time that's only supposed to last a couple of days but instead you know is lasting weeks so creating all this crazy amount of inflammation the body can't deal with. Maybe that triggers things. Maybe it's other, you know, more autoimmune type things that get triggered there. It's the body's response, exactly what you said earlier, to this long-term low-grade infection that causes the problems. And that's why it looks like lupus. And that's why it looks like fibromyalgia and all these other things that have these vague autoimmune and vague, uh, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction type diseases. You know, in some ways, maybe, you know, it is even like cancer. I'm, with all this big data uh, that's out there now, I'm really curious to see if people with Lyme disease are more susceptible to cancer later down the road because they've had so much mitochondrial dysfunction from from this uh, chronic inflammatory response or heart disease. It would be, I'm very curious to see this. Yeah, no, I, I would be curious to see that as well in terms of you know, tracking that. Um, the, I mean, there's multiple mechanisms, the mitochondrial, just the overall sort of potential immune suppression um, and combining those sort of two theories behind you know, cancer. I, I would be very, very curious. And I do uh, I want to make sure I you know, honor your time and definitely want to get into perhaps um, some treatment modalities. But um, perhaps before we, we step there, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, um, so we talked about some of the basic serologic testing that can be done. And, and I would encourage individuals stepping off of what, you know, Mackie said to approach your doctor, you know, openly, try not to be confrontational. Um, but you need to tell a a persuasive story for them to, to go down that route. And then you can ask, be inquisitive, ask questions about the test. So when they say your Lyme test was negative, well, you know, ask them what specifically, was the test or, you know, what did you test for? Um, is there any other test that goes along with it that um, could show, you know, positivity? You know, be curious, ask questions, and try not to be too confrontational because that's when, you know, I can't speak for, you know, their physicians or their reaction. That's where things sometimes can can get a little dicey, but, you know, some of those buzzwords can allow the physician to go down that line of thinking and and work with you. And then you can be the, you know, take ownership and, and ask about the specifics of the testing and, and, and feel free to request because maybe the physician doesn't know that really what they're after might be that Western blot, that assay, not the initial screening test. And and if they do have to, you know, if you do have to sign a waiver saying you may have to pay for this because the insurance might, and if you're willing to make the decision, then then go ahead and sign it. But you can have that discussion. So, um, you know, that's, a, I figured I would, you know, toss that out. And then secondarily, I, I know there's some, there are new tests coming out, um, trying to look at both Lyme and some of these co-infections. So there are some, there are classic serologic tests to look for some of the co-infections you described, the Bartonella, um, the Babesia, you know, Ehrlichia, um, some of these organisms. I, I've started, my colleague has started to work some with this, uh, I guess it's DNA connections, um, kit and testing folks. And there's even another one, I think, out there series that's looking at urine and trying to look specifically at the organism and not the antibodies or, in this case, the immune, your immune system's response to the organism. And would love to hear maybe your thoughts on some of these alternative testings, what's your experience, what's perhaps the experience of some of the, the folks in your community 
And then that can lead us into uh, our discussion on, on, on treatment. Well, right now, uh, let's see, the, the most, most of the alternative tests, there's not a lot of it around. I mean, most of it is the, the most sensitive we have is the, the Western blot. There are some urine tests out there that some of these uh, quote-unquote alternative labs are putting together. Uh, Dr. Klinghart, uh, who's a Lyme specialist, he's he's out on the West Coast. And I forget if he's in like Seattle or in Oregon somewhere. But any, anyway, he's out there. He, he came up with a few years ago the idea that if he gave somebody a prescribed a deep tissue massage the night before they had their Western blot, the day before they had the Western blot, that they would get a positive test even in cases where they had multiple negative tests up to that point. There, so there was something about physical. Yeah, yeah. I heard this too, or like some sort of strenuous <laughs> exercise. Exactly. Or so somehow yeah. physically stimulating the body, whatever that was doing, got the, the immune system going again. And so all of a sudden you'd have a, a positive Western blot. So that was interesting. He's since then moved on to a new combination of a urine catch where they're, I believe it's a RNA, but where they're testing for the RNA of mm-hmm. the, the bacteria. And, but he's, he's it's the same sort of idea. He's challenging the body first with an ultrasound. And he said, I heard, I caught him on another interview. He's coming out with a study. I haven't seen it come across my computer screen yet, which should be out like within weeks. So very, very soon where he's uh, doing preliminary studies on this. So he has this ultrasound protocol where he'd use the ultrasound on different organs and probably the spleen, I would imagine spleen, liver, who knows, maybe thymus or something like that. Yeah. But again, to kind of challenge the body in some way and then... The immune system gets going, filters out some of the these little tiny bits of proteins, and they can then be detected. So th- that that's fascinating kind of stuff. And this idea that the body needs to be challenged first to be tested is interesting. And there are uh, also some doctors who do a antibiotic challenge as well, and that seems to work from time to time. Mm-hmm. Now there's this also there's this group out in Phoenix, and unfortunately I'm totally blanking on their name. And I was trying to search for it while we were doing the while you're asking the question, I couldn't come up with it. But they're doing uh, phase whatever it is two testing for the test. They're trying to validate the test right now, and they're starting to do blood draws. And this is Dr. Ahern's work also up at SUNY Adirond- Adirondack. And I'm scheduled to go there to get my blood drawn too, uh, where they're validating okay. the test. And this is another <laughs> RNA test, but it's a serum test. And this is the this is the handheld mm-hmm. device. I heard the the president of this company talk about it and they have experience in other uh, testing domains. So Lyme isn't their first rodeo. And Mm -hmm. if he can, if he can do what he says he can do, it's going to be amazing because within the software, they're going to load in different uh, strands, strains of the Borrelia. They're going to load in co-infections, and they're even going to be able to do a bit of a differential diagnosis where they can tell if this acute phase is just the flu or if it is actually Lyme disease. All, all, mm, all in gotcha. an in-office test. I mean, that, that's going to I I, th- I think this is this is where so there there are lots of people and there's a lovely wo- woman there's a her name's Helen McCormick she's in Ireland and she's part of a very very small startup there and they're trying to do an over the counter Lyme disease a urine uh, Lyme disease test oh, so wow. there are lots of people out there working on very interesting things I think there's isn't there another group in Virginia isn't it is it UVA isn't it your backyard where they have a test so. They they might be. I mean, what what's happened at UVA? Interestingly, is um, was where the ground uh, sort of the groundbreaking research on um, the sort of quote unquote infection or the allergy to meat following a tick bite. This alpha okay, gal. Yeah, yep. Um, and so it was some immunologist at UVA who sort of discovered that uh, that process and and the ticks who um, you know, are after the tick bite that was that was causing it. And it's a it's a very interesting you know. Um, process because it's you know alpha gal basically stands for um, 
galactose, or it's a little more complicated than that, but it's, it's actually a sugar molecule, what it's reacting to. And most uh, antibodies uh, made in the body are to proteins. Right. Um, so it, we'll just maybe a little tangent here, but when you talk about like allergies to peanuts or to certain foods or to, you know, what, what are we making an, uh, an, an antibody to in the first place, it's usually some sort of protein epitope, some protein pattern of an organism or uh, of food. And, and this one curiously actually happens to be of, um, of sugar that's uh, on certain types of meats. Um, and so, yeah, they, they were the ones, I, I don't know, I'd have to go look and see if they're doing anything specifically with Lyme, but they were the, uh, the folks that kind of looked into the, the alpha-gal al- allergy related to... Yeah, um, that allergy is so. my worst nightmare. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's uh, I it's 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 very interesting, and I um, you know, I, w- I was sitting here too and wanted to make one more aside before we got into the the treatment, and you you brought up some really good points about you know these this deep tissue massage or these uh, other ways of sort of stimulating muscles tissue to then you know test, and I think you know I want to bring this back to understanding again these tests that we are doing. Are taken from blood um, or fra- you know fractions of blood, such as the the plasma, and we have to remember what the blood actually is. Um, you know, blood vessels are going traveling throughout the body and interweaving into tissues, but the blood vessels themselves are their own sort of network. And but what what they're actually trying to do is get the nutrients and you know give oxygen, for example, is the most you know, obvious thing to focus on, they're trying to get the oxygen to the cells of the tissue. So for instance, you think about any muscle, the blood is, you know, hemoglobin is carrying oxygen. This molecule hemoglobin is carrying oxygen with the sole purpose of getting it to the cell of the tissue. Its purpose is not really to send it through this, you know, the highway. And you think about, you know, the interstate, you don't stay on the interstate the entire time. You eventually get off on the exit, right? And you get off on a specific exit because that's where you want to go. Um, so when we're testing blood, um, or when we talk about these tests, we are testing from the blood, which is the interstate. But what the body is really trying to do, what it's making in this case, we're talking about you know, testing antibodies to uh, a bacteria, or it could be antibodies to anything else. But we're really, what the body really cares about is getting that antibody to right. the tissue where the bacteria is. So it's interesting that it doesn't really make sense that we're measuring the amount of the antibody on the interstate and not the amount of antibody that's gotten off the exit, aka is in the tissue where the actual, quote, battle is being fought. And we, we infer that in order for the you know, antibody to get to the tissue, it has to go through the blood. And so we kind of say, well, in, the antibody needs to be present in the blood in order to also be present in the tissue. But what we're actually kind of saying here and what some of these you know, researchers are showing is that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, Morley, I'm blanking on his last name, Morley Robbins, I think was his last name, the, the brilliant mineral man. I was just talking to him um, and we were talking, right, about the difference of mineral metabolism as measured in the blood and minerals in the cells and in the tissue and specifically focusing on iron and no one we hardly do any testing of iron in the tissue because it's extremely <laughs> Ex- we well exactly <laughs> people's livers um or yeah. muscles you know we're, we're testing it right. in the blood and we're we're assuming that what's happening in the blood the interstate highway is the same as what's happening off the exit and or in the tissues and unfortunately that's that's not really the case and you can miss the big picture and so I'm not surprised, right, when we have all these negative tests because, you know, once again, if the bacteria or in other cases the virus is doing what it really should be doing, it doesn't want to have antibodies present in the blood. And it may be in the tissue. And perhaps if your body's responding correctly, it'll have antibodies in the tissue itself. Um, And so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of lay that out there for people to understand, you know, when you go to have lab work done, and this is just one specific type of, of test, and you can't apply this to, to everything, but you're not really testing the tissue or, you know, the, the cells. You're really looking at the sort of what I call the interstate highway that's delivering all of this. Um, and that's potentially why we're limited in 
what we can and can't detect, especially when it comes to some of these bacteria and viral infections. I'm not going to get any arguments from me. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> so, tissue, right? Um, blood, blood is not yes, tissue, I, right? I, um, yeah. Blood is not tissue. Um, but yeah, so that kind of aside, I definitely wanted to get in the last maybe five ten minutes here your uh, your experience with because there's so much out there, and we've probably laid the groundwork saying, look, doxycycline, this antibiotic, is probably something that should be utilized. It's not going to be the only thing that can can help you and probably shouldn't be. Um, And that treatment may, based off of your clinical judgment, require multiple months in order to eradicate it from the tissue, just, you know, or or get it to a level that's manageable by the immune system. And was curious to get your thoughts on what out there, you know, what is out there now for people in terms of treatment across a spectrum of modalities that you you have experience with? Well, this is where things get really, really messy, right? So let me start, bring it back to my story. So when I was infected um, within three or four days, I had the rash on my shoulder. It was in the middle of summer. I had been messing around with friends down uh, in the Hudson River in a Lyme endemic area. Uh, Came back home. And was feeling okay, and then I was I was at the time a beginning student in Aikido, and which is a martial art. And basically, an Aikido workout is they throw you across the room. So I was it was a hot summer day. We're in this unair conditioned small studio. It was very hot, and there's a senior student and the instructor and myself, and they killed me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I go home that afternoon. The next day. That that must have been that's that probably a Saturday anyway whatever day it was yeah it must have been a weekend anyway that Sunday morning I felt it was the worst flu I'd ever have and I was I'm like you I don't get sick that often at all so I was just feeling miserable feeling sorry for myself I dragged myself to the mirror I'm looking at my eyes and they're bloodshot and then I kind of look down on my shoulder and and there's <laughs> there's the rash right so my rash showed up immediately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So here's one of the really strangest things. So I really, really felt terrible. And I saw that rash on my shoulder and it's like, oh, it's Lyme disease. And I instantly felt better. Now, part of that is my mm, some degree well, of exactly having a diagnosis. <laughs> it's so that's just that's one of those really weird moments. It's like, oh, Lyme disease. Now, I'm Fortunately, or fortunately, at that point, I didn't know anything about Lyme disease and the chronic nature other than you got a bullseye rash. I mean, that's really all I knew about it. I go down to the local ER, you know, I've got this rash, I think it's Lyme disease, and the doctor says, well, it sure does look like Lyme disease, where were you? Oh, you were down in the Hudson, okay, because we really don't have any up here, that makes sense, you know, we'll put you on a couple weeks of doxycycline, uh, and by the way, can everybody on duty would like to see your rash, right? So there's the, the parade <laughs> of, of nurses coming by to look at the rash, and th- you know, thank you very much, so I did my my public service duty that day. So I'm on two weeks antibiotics, you know, I'm starting to feel better. And I, luckily, I, I knew a, an herbalist uh, who's quite good. And she gave me some Tiesel extract. And so I continued to take that for another month or so afterwards, and then also got a few acupuncture treatments, just basic supportive treatments. And other, my wife says, and it's true, I lost about a, a half an inch to an inch of hairline during this episode. So it it did, hmm, yeah, it did put a strain on me, right? Or my thyroid or something, right? It definitely had some effect. And, you know, ever since then, it's like maybe my energy isn't quite as robust as it should be. But it's not like I became sickly or any other symptoms, no joints, nothing, right? Nothing at all. Um now that I'm thinking about it, I was like, well, maybe this isolated thing here or there. Anyway, nothing consistent over time, right? So, <laughs> so, so, so we caught yeah. it early. You know, do I still have Lyme? I don't. I don't know. You know, and there there have been some things actually recently, but let's let's leave that as, aside. So, I got diagnosed early. Well, and actually, and of course, I told you earlier, the test came back negative, right? So of course, it came back negative. There's no antibodies yet. I was tested mm-hmm. a couple of days afterwards. But I got, and even even with two weeks of antibiotics, being a relatively young man, being relatively healthy, it came through 
okay. And I think that's a big part of it. So I, antibiotics can be really, really useful, especially if you get it early. Especially if you get it early. Yeah. Now, if you've had Lyme disease now for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen years, and it's been misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, and all of a sudden now you're going to begin to treat it, treat it with antibiotics. There's some success with it and can be quite successful. Most of the people who've had success are on major, long-term rotations of multi. Uh, antibiotic therapy where they're doing two or three different ones at the time and they're adding in other antibiotics for the co-infections uh they're yeah i mean there's a lot of good research now i mean there was a couple of big trials out of europe that looked at you know eight to 12 weeks in these sort of post um and these more chronic pictures and basically the results were they, they weren't effective well, um these longer courses like in those that you know at least just um, specifically with, with doxycycline, they didn't have any sort of you know, m- uh, more complicated regimens. But yeah, well, um, well do you, and uh, th- this is, you know, this is why I wanted to interview that the doctor who was promoting antibiotics is because, you know, each antibiotic has a slightly different mechanism or a class of antibiotics has a different mechanism and they need to be used for different you know, if you have a biofilm, which come on, if you've had an infection for any point of time, you're going to have a biofilm built up because that's that's the other thing that I just have to put aside here. I heard this researcher, and I wish I memorized his name. He was at a uh, at a temple uh, in, in in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and he said, "Look, you know, my background is in biofilms, and we started with ear infections." Right, and he said we used to understand ear infections was if they didn't respond to antibiotics, they must be viral. He said what we found out it's not viral; it's biofilm based. So we started mm, we started yeah, wow. giving a cocktail of antibiotics instead of a single antibiotic, and we're able to break down the biofilm, and we were able to clear up these kids having chronic ear infections. He said it took a while to get the word out in this community, and I stopped and asked him. He said, "Well, you know, what about?" <laughs> How come this word hasn't gotten out to the rest of the world? Because up up here anyway, there's still people, you know, doing tubes and things like that. How come we can't clear it up? But anyway, that's another that's another discussion. But the whole biofilm issue, right? So you, you need different antibiotics for biofilm. Now, what what happens is because the bacteria and the co-infections has these different evasive behaviors, sometimes it seems like the antibiotics reach a point of diminishing returns. So we'll have people on oral antibiotics for months. There are stories of people on uh, IV antibiotics, on pick lines, and really pretty uh, heavy-duty dosage for significant amounts of time, for months at a time, right? And yet their symptoms fail to clear. So, again, the question is, is the bacteria evading treatment? Has it evolved, quote unquote evolved, has it adapted to the treatment and now resistant to the treatment? Is it just in the cyst form and hiding out? Or or what we're dealing with is more like an autoimmune issue or another more like a fibromyalgia issue where the damage from the uh, the body's response and maybe some of the damage from the antibiotics themselves is what's causing the ongoing thing. And until we get these tests cleared up, we won't know. But what happens with these people uh, is that they begin to search for alternatives, right? And God knows, once you go into the alternative world, there are all kinds of people selling everything, right? But there does seem to be a pretty good core of herbal antibiotics. And the herbals work in a more broad way, so they have multiple functions. So they're they're not just a bacteria base. They can affect viral loads as well. They can affect fungal loads as well. So they're not as, you know, so they're not as strong because they're not as pinpointed, but they have a broader effect inside the body. So these herbal regimens seem to help in some of these cases where people have reached the end point of treatment with the antibiotics and there's still a ways to go to regain their health. Um, so that's, that's kind of like, that's the main thing. And then you start getting into some interesting things uh, where who knows if it's all placebo or or, or what it is, uh, some of the electronic uh, acupuncture type things where they're using specific frequencies for f- specific infections. Any treatment that seems to support 
the immune system in general and the person in general uh, seems to be very helpful. Dietary interventions seem to be key. I've interviewed dozens of people who said, yeah, you know, the biggest turnaround happened was when I took sugar out of my diet. Uh, and so we all know sugar is very inflammatory to the body itself. And once you start opening up the the, nine, the non-pyruvate pathways, when you start digesting fats as fuel and creating ketones instead of... Um, instead of the byproducts from pyruvate breakdown, the lactic acid, then seems things seem to go easier. We all know that a ketogenic diet can be used uh, or was used a lot for epilepsy, right? So it must be doing something to calm the nervous system down. So things like that tend to be really helpful. And then, you know, basic environmental stuff. I mean, one of the problems, you know, I, I, I tell people, get out in the sunshine, and they say, oh, I can't because, you know, the antibiotic I'm on. So... You know, oh yeah, the doxycycline. Uh, yeah, it's like it's you know, it's it's it, it, it's problematic. You know, the people are you talking about being vitamin D deficient and those pathways being blocked by different viruses, and yeah, maybe that's part of the mechanism here. But you know, there's so much going on beyond vitamin D with the skin. You know, cholesterol sulfate, and there's some other things. The, the, yeah. the release of uh, physiological levels of nitric oxide. I mean, all that kind of stuff. You know, other than, besides, it just feels good. It makes you feel better. You know, there's those kind of studies, too. Going out and seeing blue sky it lifts people's mood. So, you, you know, you start yeah. putting all these things together, and then you get into, like, severe neurological Lyme, and people start having suicidal ideations. They you know, get depressed, you have all these other, you know, so now you have this multi-systemic issue going on and it's way beyond, this is why we forget it could start with an infection, you know, at this point, you know, and it start, it starts with an infection and with a low grade infection. Um, so, you know, the, the treatments, you know, I'm all for antibiotics and I think they're a great place to start and they don't work a hundred percent of the time. Uh, you know, Horowitz was doing some work with, I think it was Rosefrin, um and yeah, Sif Triaxone. Yeah, Sif and and, and um, you know, a big part of his motivation is so. For people who don't know him, he's like one of the he's the biggest guru in Lyme disease, and has written a couple of books. And people fly from all over the world to see him. And one of his big motivations is his wife has Lyme, right? And so he's yeah. trying to find, you know, the right combination of antibiotics, that, and, he, and he hasn't cracked the code with her yet. Like, she's not 100% healthy yet. You know, so it's, uh, antibiotics may get us most of the way there, or may take care of 80% of the cases or something like that, but it's not, it's not the, the only answer. So th- the next step for people, if the antibiotics aren't helping, is really you have to go after your diet and and then to find an herbal protocol that you can handle um, and that makes sense to you. And there are a couple different things out there that fit in. There's I interviewed uh, the developer of Biocidin, uh, and that's a yeah. Chinese or well, actually it's Western herb based thing, but put together by a Chinese medicine practitioner. There's the Cowden protocol. There's the uh, Buner's protocol. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are many different ones out there. And and the other thing, uh, and I'd like to connect you, my mentor, Greg Lee, he's in Frederick, Maryland, so not too far away from you. He, Yeah, Frederick's it, a nice little... It is, nice isn't it? Sound. Yeah. And so he's out there, and basically he he says, yeah, you know, I, I get all the patients who have failed on those herbal protocols. <laughs> so he gets patients oh, who wow. who failed okay, Western yeah. medicine on that antibiotic protocol. Now they've gone and done it themselves <laughs> with the herbal protocols, and they're still not getting better. This, And I think this gets back to, again, your initial point that there's this, this damage that happens as the body's trying to heal itself that it just has trouble recovering from. And may, you know, maybe Morley Robbins is right. Maybe it's just a significant, you know, magnesium and copper depletion and you just need some basic nutrition to replace these minerals and then that'll kick start the system. You know, if he's right, you know, then he's got the magic keys to the kingdom. Uh, and, and it makes a lot of sense. And I'm going I'm it's funny, I just interviewed him recently as well and uh, we'll have. To, I'm starting to use this protocol with patients, so I'm interesting to see what happens with some of these long-standing chronic, uh, chronic uh, pain people, chronic illness people that I'm seeing. Yeah, you know, I'm 
I'm very open, and I've been. Um, thank you for you know mentioning that kind of perspective of. Um, I, I hate the term alternative treatments. Um, you know, more you know holistic treatments to help people outside of the antibiotics, and have. Um, I'm actually hoping to talk with. Um, the one of the main researchers with you know, the biocidin products. I've actually been trying out. They just came out with a new. Uh, I guess you can call it. I'm a using that. <laughs> um, you are. Yeah. I know my um, my, my mouth I biome to... is not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah. give this a let me give this a shot. I you know would love to. And so far, I've been I've been pretty impressed, and I'm hoping to maybe. To, to use it with, I mean, we see, I see so much, you know, dental pathology, but um, not to get you know too far off the beaten path, path but yeah, some of the biocidin products and um, my partner, so the nurse practitioner, you know, Melanie Dorian, she, I'm working with her, she's really, she's kind of a, a some naturopathic training and really likes the, you know, the Cowden product protocol. And I've done some training with um, Chris yep. Kresser um, in his sort of collection training, and he's very much with some of the herbs and um, talks about the Buner herbs. And so there's a lot of things out there. You know, I tell people, um, yes, you, if you're going to go down one of those roads, please, you know, get with a clinician practitioner who has experience and training in that realm. And you know, to be honest, most most MDs aren't going to have experience using or prescribing those herbs. They might be you know, open and able to monitor you as you choose to you know pursue some of these things but i would really encourage you you need need to work with someone and potentially seek out somebody who can help you in that arena um because it can get a little you know complicated and i think that's where some mds feel um where we come in and say we're scared for patients to get uh you know abused or to be financially taken advantage of by some of these elaborate protocols where i do have to kind of say i look at that and i say well you know is really is everything in that really required? If we removed that one thing for this eight month protocol, like is that really going to make a big difference? And I'm you now once again kind of passing judgment because I don't have experience with the the synergy of these herbs and and how they're used. But I at least sort of say you know that it's a good intention for where you know people in traditional medicine don't want people to get abused or to sort of financially be taking you know taken advantage of and. By some of the you know, alternative practitioners, because just like there can be wonderful MDs, there's some MDs who aren't that great, and there can be wonderful alternative practitioners, and there Crooks. can be you know others who are out there just to, yeah. to make a dollar, and um, and so we have to you, know, you have to be you know cognizant of that, but at the same time recognize that we there's probably a bigger toolkit of things, and you know I've been um, you know I, I certainly have seen some benefit as well. We have a local infrared yeah. sauna um, and salt. Uh, kind of salt float tank in in Charlottesville that um, often we've kind of partnered with and been able to send patients to. And there's so many multifactorial things happening there. Most people talk about it as a great de-stressing. They get the the, the salt float or the infrared sauna and they listen to music or um, they meditate. And, and to me, it comes back to, like you said, anything that's going to help sort of the immune system. And we were talking about before the show, this concept of psycho neuroimmunology, you know, the influence of the nervous system, the influence of our own sort of consciousness to impact uh, our immune system functioning. And you can just, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I meditate and, and have a sort of asana, you know, yoga practice every, every day if I can, you know, intermix with some prayer and, and all of these things. Um, I don't sit down to do it to think about, like, I'm doing this to support my immune system. <laughs> I, I, you don't, I don't think about it like that. Just in the same way that if we go back thousands and thousands of years, you know, traditional cultures, they also, I mean, maybe they did know what the immune system was. I, I can't give them credit. To, we don't have a record that they, they knew, but hey, perhaps they, they, they knew more than we do. Um, but they were engaged in these practices and it, and it nourished them. It helped, you know, the, uh, their cultures grow and, and for them to flourish. So, you know, they must have been, you know, onto something. And so there's a lot of different things that we can do to support our immune system. And you mentioned sleep, you mentioned diet, you can, you can do these herbal protocols, you can you know, get out in the sun, you can seek out a sauna. You know, all these things uh, are really important. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, just having exposure to the bacteria, even as clear cut as we've been describing it, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get sick. I think that's the hardest thing for all of us in medicine and to understand and this was a huge battle fought between you know Pasteur and uh oh goodness 
the other gentleman and the whole microbial sort of hypothesis, but just the presence of the pathogen doesn't mean you're going to become infected. Perhaps it's the terrain or your immune system, you know, the, the environment that's as important. And we were just talking about like both of us, like pretty healthy guys. And I work in a hospital. I work with sick, sick kids. I'm exposed to junk all the day. And on paper, you would say, there's no way you wouldn't like have been exposed to something your immune system previously hadn't been exposed to. Yet I haven't manifested significant symptoms, knock on wood, for quite some time. And so you know, we have to come back and recognize that uh, it was you know a period of susceptibility whether there was some genetic influence and then environmentally at a particularly stressful time, you know, or certain exposures, or you reached a threshold of your ability to cope with oxidative damage, you know, a perfect number of variables might have gotten to a place that allowed you, allowed this bacteria in this case to take root in the tissue and manifest in an illness. But simply the presence of the bacteria or the virus does not mean you're going to be sick and some people may you know i might get crap for saying that and there's unfortunately there's not absolutes in medicine i don't mean to make that make, make that sound like a, an absolute but just think of that have that as a in the back of your mind and well the, um i wrote an interesting article of, a few you know months back about and it, it's, it's kind of far out there but telling people that we manifest symptoms so that the the symptoms that we'll pay attention to like we manifest the illness that will allow us to heal. You know, if you say, you know, if you manifest some minor symptom that's not that important to you, that's not going to get your attention. Like I said, this is a little bit kind of potentially woo-woo and far out there, but this idea of, you know, we're going to manifest the symptoms that we understand that, you know, speak to us or that will motivate us to change the aspects of our lifestyle that are out of balance. And perhaps in the spectrum of symptoms that are manifested in, you know, a Lyme disease illness, those are the things that you needed to tell you, you know, that your body needed to tell you in order to get some of the rest of your life back in balance. And, and I may receive crap for that too, but <laughs> that's just sort of, you know, that's just kind of me out there conceptualizing and, and perhaps there's something greater, but well, I, um, I, so yeah, I'll leave it well, at that. I'm, so I, I'm halfway there <laughs> with, with, with you. <laughs> You're like, man, I got no, bit no, no, by no, a tick no, no. and it, I got no, the well, well, <laughs> so, two, so, so one thing, th there are things so virulent that they'll take you down. Like if you get hit by a truck going 30 miles an hour, you're going to have damp physical damage. Done. But oh, yeah. So let's put that aside, yeah. right? Th what I see in my clinic is that the body throws up, not physically like throws up, but gives you, <laughs> it gives you symptoms early on. It's just, we no longer pay attention to those. So in that part, I agree. So at some point, something gets to the point where we pay attention to it and then we begin uh, taking action. But the body's really quite kind and generous and it's giving us signals for usually years before we get to the point where it's something serious. It's just, we don't pay attention to those signals. We're not trained to, we don't yeah. think they're important, or like, like the woman I talked about before with the stress, oh, I think I'm dealing with it okay. Uh, uh, now, I don't ask what people have in terms, I ask what medications they're taking, because that'll tell me what what they've been diagnosed. People, I would say, how's your blood pressure? It's fine. Okay, tell me what medications you're on. They list six blood pressure medications, right? Six and so, pressure I thought you said your blood pressure was fine. It is. It's under control. It's like, oh my God, if you you know forgot your meds, it'd go through the roof. It's not under control. It's just a Pressed. You know, it's like the underlying mechanism that's calling the problem with the blood pressure is still there, right? It hasn't been healed. The drugs are not healing your blood pressure. They're just keeping you from blowing a gasket. And that's very useful. But might we want also to heal the underlying issue there? So there, you know, even something serious like that, somebody will just say, oh, I'm fine. And then continue on for another five or 10 years before the stroke comes, before the, you know, the heart disease comes, you know, before the ischemic attack or whatever else happens there. So it's, I, th I think, so in some ways, yes, what finally gets our attention is what interfaces in the lesson we need to learn. But also, I think we're ignoring years of kinder, gentler messages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Man, well, well, look, I, you know, thank you for having this conversation with me. I know we've gone pretty long, and I hope, you know, the listeners who are, who are still listening are 
engaged and, and, and not too tired, but that's um, that's always a do, danger, isn't you know, it? Perhaps We've we can you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, so you know, perhaps I I'll, I'll let you know, I usually give my you know the the final sort of word, so to speak, here at the end, kind of open ended for you to share any last pieces of wisdom or a story or something that you think uh, will really resonate with with this audience that you know you'd like to share well i would just encourage people to consider that it might be lyme disease that there's this whole world of microbial uh just the whole world of microbes that beyond our gut i mean the our gut our understanding the gut biome is kind of waking us up and we're not this clean petri dish that gets infected by dirt it's more like we're this dirty petri dish and the dirt gets imbalanced and i agree with you 100 percent that it's more what's the terrain it's like what what of those virulent bacteria or viruses are, are winning the day you know are they cooperating are they in harmony or is one really uh, become a bad actor and, and taking over the show? So it's it's something to consider with health. And it again, Lyme disease can present as psychiatric illness. It can present as heart disease. It can present as fibromyalgia. It can prevent as present as arthritis. Uh, it's just. I, 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 unfortunately, just like in med school, once you learn about a new disease, you're convinced you have it. It's like, you know, it's like yeah. I see everybody says you, they must have Lyme disease, you know, and obviously that's not true. But, but there's this whole broad range of infectious agents beyond Lyme, beyond the Borrelia burgdorferi, right? That uh, we we need to start waking up to, and I think we're just beginning to do that. So, if a particular symptom calls individuals to pay attention and go into action, I think Lyme disease is calling us as a community to learn something new about health, and I think that's that's what's going on there. And then, if you want to know more about uh, my work with LymeNinjaRadio.com and the 153 episodes and interviews that I have, please come on over to Lime Ninja Radio. Dot com and peruse things, or you can go to iTunes or SoundCloud and have a look at the playlist, and maybe something will tickle your fancy. Yeah, definitely, guys. I encourage you to go check out some of you know the shows, like just 153 episodes. There's a lot of wisdom there. I mean, uh, he has a couple interviews with Dr. Terry Walls and you know, Dr. Horowitz. I mean, there's some wonderful. Interviews and, and yeah, pe- uh, people are her, goal minds over there yeah, to, people to are way out. smarter than I am. <laughs> the secret. <laughs> well, that's, 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 that's the whole idea of you know, absolutely these, these podcasts. Is, I, you know, I use it as an excuse to I have some selfish questions and ideas, and then you know I need to need to bring in you know smarter people than I am to to tell me what to do. So, um, so please go go check them out and um, and yeah, perhaps you know we'll have a, a conversation. Oh, it would definitely be. You know, I'd love to maintain this friendship going forward, and perhaps we'll have you, have you back when uh, if something new comes up. And who knows? Three, like you said, three to five years from now, if I decide I still want to be doing this whole podcast thing, and you know, there's there's a whole new test. You know, we definitely are going to have to have to talk about it. But um, thank you for for spending part of your day to to speak with me and, and our audience. You're very welcome. It's been a blast. Awesome. Well, until till next time, my friend. Be well. Thank you for your presence and willingness to receive a new narrative, a passionate perspective, and perhaps a deeper sense of connection with our collective purpose. Please share this podcast with any and all that you believe will benefit from its intention to relieve one's doing and engage one's being. Please share your comments about the conversation on our podcast page and leave a review in iTunes so that the voices in this space can spread to all ears ready to receive it. Music credit goes to Dillingham for their song, Vessel. Remain open, stay curious, and forever be love. You walked on fire And I know you tried